In three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our third session this morning at the Hypoparathyroidism Association Conference. A uh, few housekeeping rules. Just know that your microphone will be muted. And if you have any questions, please utilize the chat feature on the right hand side of your screen. It is a great honor to announce Dr. Peter Tevin, who is a pediatric endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic. So Dr. Tevin holds a joint appointment in the divisions of endocrinology in the Department of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. His research interest stems from the clinical care of both children and adults with heritable and acquired skeletal displaces and meta metabolic bone disorders. Dr. Tevin, Tevin earned his medical degree at the University of Kansas and completed residency in internal medicine and, and pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. He completed his training at the Mayo Clinic in adult and pediatric endocrinology in 2006, where he now serves as a consultant in the Bone Core Group. Dr. Tubbin has served as chair of the Pediatric Bone and Mineral Working Group for the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research, has served as a manuscript reviewer for several bone specialty and, and endocrine journals, and continues to engage in clinical research of children and adults with metabolic bone disorders. He is director of the Pediatric Bone Pediatric Metabolic Bone Clinic at the Mayo Clinic. It is a great honor to welcome you, Dr. Tevin. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for having me today. This is a, an honor to be able to participate in this meeting. This is my first uh, time to attend or present at the Hypoparathyroidism Association meeting. And I gotta say, I've, I've uh, learned a great deal and it's very exciting to see the forward progress in this area, not just in improving uh, management and, and helping patients with hypoparathyroidism with the tools that we have right now, but as you've heard with uh, some of the talks earlier today and yesterday, seeing what the future holds, and, and it seems that the, the future appears bright, which is wonderful. For the next 30 or 40 minutes, I'd like to talk about hypoparathyroidism in children, we'll talk about diagnosis and management. And in that time frame, we certainly can't cover all aspects of all conditions that, that are associated with hypoparathyroidism in kids, but I wanna give you a flavor of how we might approach the diagnosis and management a bit different, highlight a couple of the conditions that we see probably more often in children than we do in adults, and, and how we need to, to think about them in a different way when it comes to our treatment goals. So here are my disclosures. I've, I've had some research funding or done some consulting for uh, some different uh, pharmaceutical companies. Anything we talk about that's not calcium and calcitriol in, kid, in children is going to be off-label use. And we'll talk a little bit about PTH 1 to 34 and some studies done at the NIH. And uh, of course, you're gonna hear my opinion on, on my approach to management um, as well. So what should we try to cover in the time that we have here this morning? We're going to review the clinical features of hypoparathyroidism in kids. We'll, we'll pull out a few specific uh, disorders that tend to be a little bit more common in children. Uh, we'll talk about treatment strategies for children who have hypoparathyroidism and, and highlight some differences in how we approach uh, kids with specific uh, uh, causes of their, their hypocalcemia. So uh, you heard that my background is in both adult medicine and in pediatrics, and so I find myself needing to um, uh, remember that kids are not just little adults. We don't just take how we treat adults and give smaller doses to children, or it's, it's uh, more complex than that. And the causes of hypoparathyroidism in children are, are quite a bit different than the, the most usual causes in adults. 
And oftentimes these can be associated with syndromes that have other health complications that we need to keep in mind as, uh, as we help manage and think about uh, the calcium and parathyroid aspect um, of their health. We'll talk about how signs and symptoms might be different and how we identify those, discuss how growth and development factors into this, and even talk about the basics of laboratory reference ranges. Um, the reference ranges for children for many things, including calcium and phosphorus, are different compared to adults, and we need to keep that in mind as we look at and interpret test results. So what about the causes of hypoparathyroidism? As you've heard during this conference, and I'm sure you've probably heard in previous conferences, those di diagnosed as an adult, about 75% are related to post-surgical hypoparathyroidism. So thyroid was coming out for some other reason, and those parathyroid glands were inadvertently removed or damaged during that surgery. And in childhood, that's a much less common cause of hypoparathyroidism. And of the, the children that I see who have hypopara, um, uh, some do have post-surgical hypopara, but more often uh, they have a genetic cause uh, or underpinning for the hypopara. And that can stem from things like a lack of development of the parathyroid glands and a, 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 probably the most common there would be a condition called DeGeorge syndrome or destruction of the parathyroid glands. They were there initially, but due to an autoimmune process, they no longer work properly. Or an altered set point, you heard from Dr. Gaffney yesterday how this can lead to hypoparathyroidism if those parathyroid glands don't sense calcium in an appropriate way. Or um, you can have a resistance to parathyroid hormone, so you make plenty of it, it just doesn't work the way it ought to, and this is called pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. This is some data from a variety of different studies at different centers looking at what is that risk of hypoparathyroidism after a surgery. And you can see the risk of permanent hypoparathyroidism in this middle column uh, is about one to two percent. Um, transient hypoparathyroidism is much more common after a surgery. And when we looked at our Mayo Clinic experience uh, to see how many patients undergoing thyroid surgery here develop permanent hypoparathyroidism. It's fairly similar, about 1.2% in adults and 2.3% in children. So a little bit higher number, um, but the, the number of children undergoing thyroid surgery is much lower uh, compared to the absolute number of adults undergoing thyroid surgery. And we're not gonna hit everything on this list. That would be uh, way too much to, to cover in this time frame. but I wanted to put up a list of different conditions, uh, genetic and otherwise, that can lead to hypopara. Um, on the top left, you see post-surgical overall, that certainly is the most common. But when I see a child for the first time who is just diagnosed with hypocalcemia, and maybe came in and presented with that uh, a seizure uh, that prompted coming in. Um, if it's due to a parathyroid problem, we have quite a long list of things we need to think about as far as what might be the underlying cause of hypopara. When I meet an adult in clinic who has a known diagnosis of hypoparathyroidism, the first thing I look at is to see where that scar is on their neck because post-surgical is going to be most common. It's different when we see children though. Another way to think about these different conditions are those conditions that lead to isolated hypoparathyroidism. So there, there really are no other health uh, conditions associated with that. And you can see a list of different genes. And if there's a variant in one of those genes, it can lead to hypoparathyroidism. And then on the right-hand side of the screen under the, the syndrome column, these are this is not an, uh, a complete list, but just a, an example of uh, a variety of different conditions associated with hypopara that we might see in children uh, that have other health conditions that go along with it that may impact the care of that patient in a significant way. So let's talk about just a few of those to highlight the more common uh, genetically based conditions that we might see in children uh, and how these conditions may impact our, our management. Uh, and recommendations for caring for your kids. So autoimmune polyendocrinopathy, candidiasis, ectodermal dystrophy, that is a mouthful. I like to call it by its other name, APS1, 
which stands for autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1, which is just very descriptive. It's an autoimmune process. Polyglandular just meaning it involves multiple glands, and it's a syndrome. The three most common um, conditions that go along with this or manifestations of this condition are mucocutaneous candidiasis, so thrush, adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease, and hypoparathyroidism. And typically, most individuals with a, a variant in this AIRE gene will have at least two of these three components. But listed on the right-hand side under other manifestations, you can see that many patients will have a multitude of other uh, endocrinopathies that can go along with this condition, including hypogonadism, hair loss or alopecia, um, GI problems, including malabsorption. And you can imagine if, if you have a, a, a malabsorption problem on top of hypoparathyroidism, that's going to make management much more challenging if you don't absorb that calcium and calcitriol efficiently. DeGeorge syndrome uh, is a condition where the parathyroid glands don't form properly. And this is due to a loss of some genetic material on the uh, chromosome 22. And if you lose uh, uh, part of the DNA in that area, it can lead, lead to a number of problems, including uh, a lack of formation of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches. And that's embryologically where the parathyroid glands come from. So these children often have hypocalcemia and hypoparathyroidism diagnosed shortly after birth, but also have coexisting cardiac problems that may require surgery to fix. Uh, can also uh, have challenges with uh, immune deficiencies as well and frequent infections. And activating calcium sensing receptor variants, this is the autosomal dominant hypoparathyroidism type 1 that you heard Dr. Gaffney talk about yesterday. I thought she did a very nice job talking about how the calcium sensing receptor is really that thermostat that sits on different cells in our body including in the parathyroid gland and in the kidney as well. And it basically serves as the thermostat, but it's broken. You might set that thermostat at 72 degrees. The room is 60 degrees, but the thermostat doesn't kick on the furnace or doesn't turn on the parathyroid glands because it thinks it's at the right temperature when it's really not. And so parathyroid hormone is not secreted when it should be in the face of low calcium. And what uh, makes, makes uh, managing folks with a calcium sensing receptor more challenging is that this receptor is also present in the kidney and helps that kidney reclaim a lot of the calcium that's filtered. Yesterday, you heard that about 10 grams of calcium flows through our kidneys as an adult uh, each day, and that all but a small fraction of that comes back into the system and, and doesn't make it out into the, the urine. But when this calcium sensing receptor is not working properly, a lot more calcium sneaks out into the urine and can cause troubles with calcification in the kidney or kidney stones. And, and the last one that we'll touch on as far as the specific causes of hypoparathyroidism in kids is this pseudo hypoparathyroidism. And it's, it's fairly unique compared to the others because this is not a problem with how parathyroid hormone is produced or a lack of production. In fact, parathyroid hormone levels are quite high, and, um, but calcium levels are still low. The reference on this slide is to a paper uh, that's fairly recent that talks about diagnosis and management of patients who have pseudohypoparathyroidism and some other related conditions. And this image is, is from that article. And I love it because it shows just how complex this whole system is. And that if you have a, a, an abnormality anywhere along the way in this pathway, it can lead to uh, problems with how that parathyroid hormone is functioning. So just to walk through this graph, this is all uh, part of a cell membrane. Um, and this is parathyroid hormone floating around in the bloodstream and coming into uh, contact with the parathyroid hormone receptor right here. And you can see then on the inside of the cell, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of machinery here. 
But folks with pseudo hypoparathyroidism have uh, this this alpha subunit part of the machinery is broken and it doesn't work, so it can't send those signals that normally would be propagated after parathyroid hormone sits on the receptor. And so there's a lot of parathyroid hormone around, but it just can't get the work done that it needs to inside the cell. And so they develop essentially hypoparathyroidism, even though there's a lot of parathyroid hormone around. Pseudo hypoparathyroidism comes in many different varieties. Uh, the, the sort of quintessential, I suppose, parathyroid, pseudo hypoparathyroidism is type 1A. And this not only includes some of the biochemical abnormalities, so the high parathyroid hormone, low calcium, and high phosphorus, but also has some physical changes, uh, including short bones in the hand and short bones in, in the feet as well. So some of the fingers look shorter uh, than they ought to be, shorter stature early fusion of the growth plate, so children stop growing before we expect them uh, to be done growing as they go through puberty. And they can also have resistance to other hormones like thyroid hormone. So it's very common for children with pseudo hypoparathyroidism to have a thyroid hormone deficiency that needs treatments as well. And this is a chart from that same paper that looks at pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1A, 1B, and then just to make things complicated, we also have a pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism as if the other two were not a mouthful <laughs> enough to try and say. But you can see this brachydactyly is the short fingers and toes, the bone age or the, the, the growth plates being advanced or more mature than we would expect based on how old kids are. Can have uh, calcification of soft tissues, the parathyroid hormone resistance leading to the low calcium in high phosphorus, but also many of them having uh, resistance to other hormones such as thyroid hormone. So you can see for a lot of these conditions that lead to hypoparathyroidism during childhood, there's a lot more aspects to their care and things that we need to think about um, compared to those that may have hypoparathyroidism related to a surgery and not part of one of these syndromes. So again, children are not just little adults, and, and we'll keep that in mind as we uh, talk about the signs and symptoms that can occur in kids and how that might differ from grownups. We're gonna talk about growth and development because of course kids are getting bigger and their, their skeleton is getting uh, larger as they grow and touch on the, the laboratory reference ranges and how they differ in children compared to adults and how that then factors into making adjustments in, in medication doses and how we monitor. This is for older kids and adults, and this is a list that any medical school student in their first or second year is going to hear about what symptoms a, a patient might experience when they have low calcium. And that neuromuscular irritability, the paresthesias, the tingling in the fingers, the lips, the toes, the muscle cramps that might come on, or if it gets worse, the tetany, so the rest of the muscles cramping up calcium levels drop rapidly or, or quite or even lower, uh, seizures or laryngospasm, so it's hard to breathe because those muscles around the, the windpipe or in, in the, the trachea are, are contracting. And then having cardiac manifestation, so heart failure can be a, a symptom of severe uh, hypocalcemia or some changes on the EKG, that electrical tracing of the heart that makes us worry about um, arrhythmias that could occur as well. One thing that I think is wonderful and in large part due to all of you out in the audience right now and the Hypoparathyroidism Association is that, that over the recent years we've gained a much greater understanding of all of the other symptoms that go along with hypoparathyroidism that don't make it into this list of classic symptoms that you know us in medical school learn um, and I think it's great that, that we're becoming more aware of uh, all the other ways that hypoparathyroidism impact your life day to day and using that as a, um, an instigator to, to move all of this forward and come up with better treatment options than we have right now. So what about infants and young kids? I think it's important to note that oftentimes you won't see any signs, those physical things that we can look and see as a caregiver or a provider or symptoms. 
And even if they do have symptoms, infants and young children have a lot of difficulty recognizing or they just can't recognize them as symptoms of low calcium. And if they do, uh, then trying to communicate them is challenging as well. So especially for infants and younger children, the onus is, is on us as providers and, and you as caregivers and parents to be watching closely for what are those signs, those things that we can see in our kids or your kids uh, that might be a symptom or a, a, a factor showing us that calcium levels might be too low. And in infants, sometimes that's just being jittery or jumpy or irritable, having poor feeding, the calcium levels go lower, maybe noisy breathing, some wheezing or strider. Strider is a noisy uh, breathing that comes from the, the larger airways in the top of the throat. Or tetany is something that we can see or seizures. But of course, we don't want to wait uh, until those things happen because that's way downstream. We want to uh, be paying attention to those symptoms that we can notice earlier on. And oftentimes, both for adults and for kids, the symptoms or the signs of low calcium each time they happen are very similar for each child. And so recognizing what does it look like the last time uh, low calcium occurred so that maybe we get better at identifying those signs earlier on um, until kids get old enough to be able to recognize and communicate those symptoms on their own. And here's a graph on the right hand side of uh, normal growth and development. And this is uh, for growth from a, a length or a height perspective. And over here on the left hand side of this graph is centimeters per year. We could substitute that for inches per year. And down here is just age. So as you get older, it's just showing how that rate of growth changes. And you can see infants in that first year of life, they're growing at a tremendous rate and their skeleton's getting bigger and their body overall is getting bigger. And this is actually the most rapid rate of growth that children will go through at any point in life, even faster than during puberty. Infants can grow up to 10 inches in the first year of life and their weight is tripled. So you can see that this is a time of life where number one, they can't communicate their symptoms well. And uh, number two, they're growing so quickly. We're gonna have to monitor uh, fairly frequently uh, to make sure we're keeping up with uh, calcium and calcitriol doses or whatever therapy they might happen to be on. Then, of course, there's a lot of bone acquisition going on during puberty, during these growth spurts for both boys and girls. Another time in life where we might have to monitor things a bit more quickly or more frequently. What about calcium and phosphorus reference ranges? I think just in general, it's important to know that calcium and phosphorus are both uh, higher in kids than they are in adults, particularly in infants. And uh, these are the reference ranges that I have here at Mayo Clinic. They don't have reference ranges for phosphorus under one, but I'll tell you a newborn infant in that first year or first month of life may have phosphorus levels that are up to eight milligram per deciliter, nearly double what we would expect in an older child or an adult. And so it's important as, as your provider and you are interpreting test results, you're taking into account how old uh, your child is and in, in then applying the normal reference ranges uh, to those results to then make better decisions about how to make adjustments in medications. So now let's move on to uh, treatment strategies for kids. And again, there's a lot of overlap here in, in what we have to treat children with hypoparathyroidism compared to adults. So the parts I wanna focus on are those that may be a little bit different in kids or nuanced in kids uh, compared to adults with hypopara. And I also wanna keep in mind the big picture here. Uh, kids call, come in all shapes and sizes as do adults. And I'm sure as a group, when you're able to be together and uh, at the annual meeting and talking with each other, you realize that each of you has a much different experience with hypoparathyroidism, some with a lot more challenges and others without uh, as many challenges. Um, same thing is true for children. And I think that's just compounded when we think of all of the different reasons for hypoparathyroidism in kids stages of growth and development that's different uh, for children as well. So we're gonna take uh, sort of that big picture view of this, but also give you my approach um, uh, in general guidance that I, that I use myself in clinic that I think we can apply in a general sense to, to most or all children with hypopara. 
And uh, this is something I like to keep uh, keep myself reminded of and talk to families about periodically as well. What is the big picture? What are we really trying to accomplish here? And what we want to do is minimize those symptoms of hypocalcemia, minimize the symptoms of hypopara, uh, and also keep in mind we want to see normal growth and development. And that needs to be balanced with avoiding the complications of treatments. So that high blood calcium or that high urine calcium that can lead to kidney stones or calcification of the kidney or kidney dysfunction. We could certainly just you know, raise the doses of calcitriol and phosphorus or parathyroid hormone to where calcium levels would never be low, but most of the time that's going to be at the expense of developing a complication. So the same thing is true for kids as it is in adults. So when we think about long-term management, what do we have in the toolbox? Well, we have calcium and calcitriol. We have parathyroid hormone. It would be off-label use, but there are some studies and we'll touch on a couple of those. We have thiazide diuretics. Those are those water pills that can help prevent the extra calcium loss in the kidney. So if we're struggling to get those urine calcium levels down, sometimes a thiazide diuretic can be helpful. Occasionally we need a low phosphorus diet or low phosphorus formula. For infants who might be breastfeeding or on formula, breast milk actually is relatively low in phosphorus, uh, so that's great. Um, and there are other uh, formulas that are available that have lower phosphoric content than others, so sometimes changing the formula can be helpful at bringing that phosphorus concentration down. It's not too common that we need a phosphate binder, but sometimes that uh, can help. And then you've heard about over the last several days emerging therapies that are more targeted for treatment of hypoparathyroidism. You heard from Dr. Gaffney yesterday, so sort of a, a call to not forget about the children and, and a hope that as we move forward with some of these studies in adults, that we can then start to, to get more studies done in children to see if we can translate using new and emerging therapies to the younger population as well to benefit. So as far as calcium goes, the dose is really dependent on how old that child is, how big that child is, and what their individual needs are. Some forms of hypoparathyroidism are, are more mild and don't require a lot of supplements, and others require quite a bit. Just, for, uh, just to get us in the ballpark, for infants, an initial dose of, of calcium might be 50 milligram per kilogram, so it's a weight-based dose. Uh, per day in divided doses. Sometimes it's more than that, sometimes it's less, but this is an, often a place that we'll start and then make adjustments based on the response in the calcium levels. For adolescents and young adults, the doses of calcium are going to be similar to what we see in adults. Sometimes it takes very little, but other times it may be several grams of calcium. And when we talk about calcium, I think it's important to talk about the, the, the elemental calcium. So the two major types of calcium, calcium carbonate, calcium citrate, calcium carbonate is probably the more common one. Only 40% of what's in that tablet is elemental calcium, whereas calcium citrate is only 21%. And there's so many forms of calcium out there. I think it's important to find one in, in, and stick with it. And if you're going to make a change from one to another, you want to be meticulous at making sure that the amount of elemental calcium is going to be the same from the old form that you might have been on to the, the new form. This is going to be true for kids or adults. Um, it, it makes it a bit tricky sometimes reading those labels, but work with your, your providers and pharmacists to make sure that when you switch from one calcium variety to another that you're getting uh, what you think you are. And how about CALS trial again? It's the same concept that that dose is going to vary quite a bit based on age and individual needs. Um, liquid form is available. It's one microgram per ml. So this is a pretty concentrated form of, of uh, CALS trial. So it's important to be precise. Now, I'll often use tiny syringes, insulin syringes, and put a piece of tape around uh, where they need to, where you need to pull up to, so that you're not getting uh, too much or too little. Often a starting dose for infants might be 20 to 40 nanogram per kilogram per day, not microgram, not milligram, but nanogram. So these are small amounts given once or twice a day. And for older children and adolescents, the doses that we're using are, are often typical to what we see in adults as well. 
how do we make adjustments? I think uh, one of the next talks that you'll see uh, is going to go over in a lot more detail um, uh, how we interpret patterns of labs, but really it is looking at a pattern of labs. It's never just the blood calcium or just the blood phosphorus or just the urine calcium levels, but looking at all of those things together and um, keeping in mind, well, what do these different medications do? And if we give more calcitriol, both the blood calcium and phosphorus levels are going to go up, but so is the urine calcium. So if phosphorus levels being high is a problem, increasing calcitriol might not be the next step. Uh, more calcium is going to increase the blood and urine calcium levels, but it can lower phosphorus, particularly if it's taken with meals to bind some of the phosphorus that's in the food. So looking at that pattern of labs and knowing what impact these two medications will have on those lab parameters really helps guide what direction uh, we're going to go with the treatment, either a higher dose or lower dose, and which one we might choose. Well, what about parathyroid hormone? As I'm sure all or most of you are aware, Dr. Weiner's done uh, some great work in this at the NIH, and a couple of years ago published a, a long-term study of 14 kids with hypoparathyroidism looking at safety and efficacy. And they uh, were given parathyroid hormone two or three times per day for an average of uh, six years or seven years. And I'll walk you through this, this graph. At the top here, on the top left, this is the baseline calcium levels. Many had low calcium, some normal and some high, but most of them had high urine calcium, and that's what we see over here on the top right. And then after being on parathyroid hormone, we have fewer with high calcium, some with low, some with normal, but a lot fewer uh, with high urine calcium levels. So these are similar data to what we've seen in some of the adult studies with uh, parathyroid hormone replacement, but very importantly, these kids demonstrated normal linear growth and bone density accrual. Uh, so those things that we think about for kids that aren't uh, evaluated in some of the adult studies. And this is another one of Dr. Weiner's studies looking at parathyroid hormone in a pump versus uh, twice daily injections. And I put this up just to show that we see very similar data in that the fluctuations in blood and urine calcium tend to be much less with a pump compared to uh, uh, injections once or twice daily. Well, how do we monitor? We're going to monitor blood tests. Calcium, phosphorus, and creatinine are probably the most important and the most frequent things that we test. Uh, we want to periodically look at calcium and creatinine in the urine to make sure that we're, there's not uh, too high levels there. For younger kids and infants, uh, we often look at a calcium to creatinine ratio. Those ratios of how much calcium versus creatinine are in the urine uh, vary tremendously in childhood. And so again, having those normal uh, ranges uh, based on age are really important. Once kids are older, we think about doing the 24-hour urine calcium as a a uh, sense of what's coming out throughout the entire day, not just at one time during the day. We're going to be watching growth and developments and periodically taking a look at the kidneys with uh, ultrasound primarily. Uh, like ultrasound, it's very sensitive at looking for calcification in the, in the kidneys and there's no radiation involved with it. Another question I get asked often and is important to, to think about is, well, how often do we check these labs? And I, I, I think about that in three different stages. Really, if there's an acute episode of severe hypocalcemia, maybe this is at the, the beginning uh, when, when the low calcium and parathyroid problem is just diagnosed or something happened and uh, there's a, a hypocalcemic crisis, calcium and phosphorus might be monitored multiple times during a, a single day while in the hospital until those levels stabilize. And then we, we check things less frequently. And then I think of the dose titration phase. So things are stable enough to go home, but we are still in this uh, adjustment phase to make sure that we get the doses dialed in just right, enough, but not too much. And this might be daily monitoring of blood calcium levels or maybe up to monthly, just depending on where in that phase of dose titration you might be. And boy, it's exciting to hear about the possibility of a home calcium monitor. It would make these things uh, make this a whole lot easier for so many of you and so many families. And then I think of it as in the maintenance phase. So we've really dialed those doses in. And so uh, we don't need as frequent of monitoring, 
but for infants, because they're growing so fast, they can't communicate their symptoms, might still check labs every month to make sure things are in the right range and we don't need to make an adjustment. For older children and adolescents, I'm typically checking these labs every three to four months, urine tests less frequently. And then what about severe symptomatic hypocalcemia? Um, I put this up mainly to point out that uh, we need to think about not just what the blood calcium is, but how severe are those symptoms when deciding uh, if IV calcium is needed. And these are thinking things that ER doctors uh, need to be thinking about when, when you're in to see them with a, a, an episode of severe hypocalcemia. Um, and then for children, it's a, a weight-based dose. And this is something that even with your uh, endocrinologist working out ahead of time so that you can share that with providers that might not be as familiar with hypocalcemia and, and how it needs to be treated and what the appropriate doses are so that you've got that information readily available if you do need to make a trip to the emergency department. And now I want to uh, use the last bit to talk about primarily the calcium sensing receptor variants and the pseudohypoparathyroidism and how we might approach those a little bit differently. So again, with the calcium sensing receptor variant, this is that altered calcium set point or the broken thermostat. Um, and remember this sensor is also present in the distal tubule, so high urine calcium levels are nearly universal and very challenging uh, to manage. Um, our goal blood calcium is still gonna be in that low normal range or a little bit low while you know, trying to keep it uh, at that low range, but avoiding symptoms of hypocalcemia. But in, in those of you with the calcium sensing receptor variant, I think checking that urine calcium more frequently and probably having those renal ultrasounds done more frequently makes sense um, uh, so that we can address high urine calcium if need be. I think it's more likely to need a thiazide diuretic to lower that urine calcium. And uh, magnesium uh, can often be low with calcium sensing receptor mutations. And, Remembering back to some of the talks from earlier this uh, in the last few days, uh, magnesium is important for parathyroid hormone production and action. So if magnesium deficiency is coexistent, we want to address that as well. So there's some differences that we might think about with uh, those of you who have uh, calcium sensing receptor changes. And with pseudohypoparathyroidism, one part that's much different is we want to monitor the parathyroid hormone levels as well. And in pseudohypoparathyroidism, we can typically uh, bring calcium levels much more into the normal range, even into the mid or sometimes upper part of the normal range, while uh, trying to keep the parathyroid hormone in the upper part or slightly high. We don't want to make the PTH too low because then that's going to cause troubles with too much calcium in the urine again. But in general, folks with pseudohypoparathyroidism don't have as much trouble with high urine calcium levels. So we can afford, so to speak, to raise those blood calcium levels a bit more and give some more buffer uh, before symptoms might occur. And with pseudohypoparathyroidism, um, parathyroid hormone is not going to work. Um, the endogenous, what, our body, what your body makes doesn't work. So what we could give uh, as a, a therapy wouldn't work either. So we're really left with using uh, the calcitriol and calcium supplements. And here are my final thoughts. I think having a plan, this can apply to adults as well, but some things that are specific to kids. Know your child's diagnosis. If you don't know the cause of the hypoparathyroidism, I think it's important to, to know that because it might have a big impact on treatments and, and monitoring over time. Finding a provider who has experience managing hypoparathyroidism. Many of you might have to travel long distance to see an endocrinologist. So engaging your local primary care doctor about who's going to be um, uh, ordering labs, how often do they need to be done, how does that get communicated to your endocrinologist and then uh, communication back to you uh, to make the appropriate adjustments and treatments. And think ahead about uh, when you might need to adjust treatment or when monitoring uh, more frequently might be needed during illness, how is that managed? What about puberty? Uh, will we check uh, labs more frequently during puberty? Uh, what about sports uh, activities and other exercise? How might that influence um, uh, extra calcium doses that might uh, be helpful? And then plan for that transition of care, not just from going from a pediatric to an adult provider, but what about moving from home, going to college? Where are they going to get care? 
how will monitoring be managed? Is that going to be back home or where they are in college? Who's going to be responsible for that? Uh, and then educating your child on his or her medical condition. The more they know, the better this transition is going to happen. And because I have a foot in both worlds, I see kids and adults. I see the, the importance of doing this starting early and repeating often like so many things we teach our kids. And I'd just like to say again uh, uh, how, how grateful I am to be able to participate in this. And I've learned a lot, not only from the talks, but just gaining a lot of insight from the questions you, as, as uh, the patients and the participants in this, the questions you've asked uh, really have given me a lot of insight into what's um, managing hypoparathyroidism is, is like on a day-to-day -day basis and what aspects of things do we need to be working on to help uh, give all of you a brighter future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Dr. Tubbin. We do have some questions for you. Um, have you noticed with ADH1 in girls that symptoms begin to be noticeable to the child when menses begin, although not on a regular menses cycle? Any ideas as how to manage calcium and calcitriol during dosing during puberty? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think um, the general concept of uh, during puberty, uh, because that's a time of rapid skeletal growth as well, uh, more frequent monitoring is probably needed. And for girls, and this wouldn't isn't true just for ADH1, but any cause of hypoparathyroidism, those symptoms might be more uh, pronounced or frequent uh, at or around the time of, of menstrual cycles. And so it might be that doses of calcium may need to be adjusted during that time uh, to prevent those symptoms. Now, um, I, I heard uh, yesterday during one of the talks that it's important also to try and separate out symptoms that might be from other conditions or symptoms that, that may not be related to a change in calcium but are related to the menstrual cycle. So sometimes it means checking calcium levels during those times to know, is this related to a lower calcium or is it something else? Because our management's gonna be quite different. Okay, um, next question. I have hypopara with the CASR gene mutation. My daughter's endo thinks she has the gene mutation as well. Her PTH is extremely low and her blood calcium is in the low normal range. So far, she only had to be on calcium right after she came home from the calcium, but she is no longer on it because her calcium went up. She is five months old and breastfed. Her endo thinks the breast milk is keeping her levels up <clears throat> despite her low PTH. Should we watch her levels closer when she weans? Is breast milk keeping her calcium levels up? and what is a good calcium level for babies, which I think you answered in one of your slides. Yeah, so calcium levels are a bit higher uh, in, in infants than they are in older children and adults. So applying that appropriate reference range will be important. But if there's a question about the diagnosis or labs that have been borderline, um, I think having the genetic testing done is, is a great way to know uh, for sure whether, um, uh, this is something that, need, that you need to worry about or not. So if genetic testing hasn't been done, I think that would be a great next step um, because it's going to dictate how frequently things need to be monitored. Okay, is it important to do a 24-hour urine on an infant? Yeah, I find that very challenging or uh, um, not possible for most mm -hmm. infants. If we were going to do a true accurate 24-hour urine collection, usually that would mean putting a, a catheter into the bladder, which has its own risks and, and challenges. And I, I don't think that's a good idea. So normally for infants and young children, I'll rely more on the calcium to creatinine ratio, something that we can, information we can obtain from just a spot urine uh, collection. So a small amount in a cup or for infants, um, the lab will, should have a, a little baggie that, that sticks on and you just wait for them to fill it with some urine and that gets turned into the lab. Okay, we just have one last question because time is up. Um, are teeth abnorm abnormalities usually encountered? Uh, with some conditions that cause hypoparathyroidism can have dental abnormalities as well, but that's not true of all of them. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You provided 
so much information um, for our, us parents out there and everyone. So thank you. Uh, we are going to take a break now until 1130 and we will see you then. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you so much, Dr. Tebbin. We really appreciate having you here today. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, thank you for everything. <laughs>